Hello and welcome back to another Naval News Update. Today's story comes at us from the war zone. Credit to Thomas Nudick for writing this story. He says, Russia's only pump jet kilo class submarine is back to attack Ukraine. After an eventful career, which is the purpose of today's video, a sole pump jet kilo class submarine is likely to embark in combat operations against Ukraine. I recommend everyone go over to the drive slash the war zone and check out all the articles over there. But this one was written uh, and published on June 28th by Thomas. Uh, we'll read a little bit here at the start and then we'll get into the meat of it in a second. Uh, a unique Russian diesel electric submarine, the Alrosa. Uh, has returned for sea trials ahead of rejoining the Black Sea Fleet with a new armament of cruise missiles. The one-off submarine is the oldest of the Black Sea Fleet and is likely to join combat operations against Ukraine, where Russia is now waging an intensified campaign of missile bombardment. And this will add an additional, you know, missile launching capability to the fleet here. Uh, also from Mr. Frantariel's uh, Twitter account, he shows us some pictures of the newly refurbished submarine sitting pier side. And uh, we'll watch this video in just a minute. So, yeah, the purpose of today's talk is to talk about just how capable is this unicorn pump jet kilo one of a kind submarine? Uh, what is its history and what is its new capability? But first, I would like you to go over to HayesGreyApparel.com and check out all the really cool things that they have over there, whether it's coffee mugs or T-shirts in all sizes for all ages from small to 5X, uh, which is basically a tent. And they come in all sorts of colors and styles, whether it's Naval Aviation, Marine Corps, um, and everything in between. They, they have a, a lot of stuff here. And if you use sub 10, sub 10, that's your, uh, you get a 10% off discount code for anything that you buy on checkout. So make sure you put in sub 10 uh, on your checkout and uh, get 10% off your order. Look at this. I love these little onesies. Yeah. You know, if you have a baby or if you know someone that has a baby, you got to get them one of these from newborn to 24 months uh, and all the sizes in between. This is really cool. All right, let's get to the video. All right, well, welcome to the Pump Jet Kilo uh, talk. This is Project 877 Victor. Project 877 is the entire Kilo class, approximately 40 submarines that the Soviets and Russians have built over many decades, exporting many of them to places like China, uh, Iran, Algeria, India has a couple. So very popular, very capable submarine build. But the Victor variant... 877 Victor is a one of a kind pump jet kilo and uh, it was pretty capable and it accomplished what it wanted to do and that was be very, very quiet. All right, let's take a look at our sources here. Like I said, um, deepstorm.ru is like an online encyclopedia. It has every single Russian submarine ever built in Russia and very detailed histories on each one of these things. This thing is priceless to me doing this series. So thank you, deepstorm.ru. Uh, the Drive the War Zone author, Thomas Nudick, uh, came out with a recent story about the pump jet. So credit to him. Thanks for bringing my attention to this. And Mr. Fran Torelli uh, from Twitter had some great photos that we used. And Zvezda News has a video that we're going to watch talking about this new sub, or not a new submarine, but a submarine that's just recently come out of dry dock for a long period of time. All right. This is hull number B871, the one of a kind pump jet kilo project 877V. So pump jet propulsion, as you can see there, basically it's just a big metal shroud around a single screw that spins in there. The screw's got like 11 blades and the stator's got another seven. So you can do the math and figure that out. Now, the kilo class as a baseline is already very quiet. But whenever they shrouded the screw, what they did is they were able to turn that screw faster before uh, cavitation inception begins, getting a higher speed before cavitation with the sacrifice of a lower top end speed. And what that means is on the surface, uh, a normal kilo without the shroud can do approximately 10 knots. This one can do only approximately eight. So a couple knots when she surfaced uh, removed, but when she submerged her max speed is a little more than 15 knots versus a kilo's 18 knots uh, without the shroud. So, but what the shroud does is it allows you to get closer to that 15 knots, say 11, 12, maybe 13 knots before you begin cavitating. So this submarine would be able to travel faster at a, with quieter signatures than a 
other type of kilo that would be cavitating at say 12 or 13 knots. And that's the benefit you get by having this shroud around your screw. But they only did it to one. It was a one-off experiment. They learned what they learned from it. And then they went about making kilos with regular screw skewed screw blades again because you can get a similar effect from a skewed screw on a submarine. All right, so this is the video of it coming out of uh, mooring trials, getting ready to go to sea trials just a few days ago. And so here we have, um, this looks like diesel seawater being ejected. That diesel seawater is cooling the internal equipment like the diesel generator and other systems as well. Now she's being towed away from the pier. She's not under power yet. She's not, she's not moving yet. You'll know it when it happens. Okay, here we have no movement. We have no diesel seawater overboard. The tugboats are repositioning. Probably gonna take that line off so she can start going down the uh, the river there. There's the access hatch on the side. Okay, now the diesels are running. You can see the exhaust right there next to my little cursor. So the diesel exhaust comes out right below the water line so that there's enough pressure to push the exhaust out, not back into the engine, right? But it also keeps the smoke down by blowing it right into the water. So here we have diesel seawater uh, cooling water right there. And then we have the exhaust, the actual diesel exhaust out there pushing uh, the motor generator to turn the screw. Diesel electric submarine. Here we have some fair water planes. You could call these bow planes. Uh, they do. Uh, technically, they're not fair water planes, but they're also not on the bow. <laughs> they're just these little forward planes that are topside. These are used for controlling the submarine while it's submerged. These are torpedo tubes up here and the... Uh, Looks like some piece of fiberglass there on the dome there. All right, so that's video of it coming out from just a few days ago, folks. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the history of this ship is extremely unique. So not is it a unique design, a one-off unicorn, if you will. Uh, the, the history of the crew is bonkers. So on December 1990, uh, she's commissioned into the Black Seas Fleet Service. And this is the last normal day this submarine is going to see for the rest of her life. On March 13th, 1992, just two years later, Lieutenant Commander Petrenko and Captain First Class Lupikov, not the captain and first officer of the submarine, but officers inside the submarine, gather all the UK crane conscripts one evening uh, after everyone's kind of gone home for the day. And they uh, bring them onto the pier, this group of Ukrainian sailors. And I should explain that after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the crews continued to operate these ships and submarines uh, relatively normally, you know, whenever they went to sea. And they were a mix, in this case, of Ukrainian and Russian born sailors. And that was never a problem until the Soviet Union collapsed. And then there's a question of do ships that belong in Crimea, Ukraine, do, do, do they belong to Russia or do they belong to the Ukrainians? Well, these two officers read the oath of allegiance to the people of Ukraine, to the U to the Ukrainian crew members saying, do you remember this oath you took when you joined the service? You know, you're, you're, you're loyal to Ukraine, not Russia. Let's take this submarine in the name of Ukraine. So eight other officers signed their allegiance to this essentially declaration of independence on this piece of paper, and they want to commandeer the submarine. Well, on board the submarine, there are overnight watchstanders from the regular crew, both Ukraine and Russian down there, right? Well, a couple of Russian mechanics hear what's going on topside, and they get really up freaked out about this, right? They lock themselves in the machinery room. That's where the diesel and the generators are at all the electrical stuff. They lock themselves in that room and they say they're not coming out until they can talk to the captain. And Oh, by the way, you better go get the captain quick because they secured ventilation to the battery wells, which means there's a slow hydrogen buildup already beginning there. And when enough hydrogen gets concentrated, it just self explodes, it self ignites. And uh, in a confined space, that becomes an explosion. And they're gonna blow up the submarine uh, with a battery explosion unless they get to talk to the captain, these two Russian uh, sailors down there. So uh, the Russian uh, crew, is most of it is off the submarine right now, and the captain is up in uh, like the galley area on, on the uh, shore with their officers. So word gets out to the Russian crew that's not on board and to the captain and the XO. And they come down to the ship to find out what the hell's going on. This is all going on at night, by the way, March 13th, 1992. Captain goes on board the ship. He meets with Lieutenant Commander Petrenko and declares 
the lieutenant commander's actions illegal and uh, he's he goes to get onto the telephone that's right there in the command space to call the base commander to tell them what's going on and the mutineers disconnect the phone so now this is becoming getting to a breaking point of uh you know are these guys going to be hostile and take hostages or are they going to try and escape with a submarine what's going to happen next so the real first officer the russian first officer of the ship runs to the pier the captain of the submarine stays with his submarine and telling these guys they're not going anywhere with their submarine and the first officer is going to go get the base admiral and and we're going to talk about this right this is not going to end well for the mutineers so while the first officer is getting uh, the base commander, uh, the captain goes topside and musters the entire crew. Ukrainians, Russians, they got the rest of the crew out of the barracks now. Everybody's on the pier now. And the captain starts explaining what's going on. He, in front of the entire crew, relieves Lieutenant Commander Petrenko of his duties, which implies probably being arrested as well um, for, for trying to do a mutiny. Uh, the other subordinate that was with uh, Petrenko Lupikov begins shouting that they can't do this. They can't relieve him and, you know, arrest him for this. And then Leparkov or Lupikov jumps into a boat and retreats. Now, I don't know that what that translation means, because if it's just he went back down to the submarine, the boat to get away from topside, well, then he was arrested, too. Or it could literally mean he jumps into a small boat because they're on a waterfront and escapes across the harbor, you know, probably fleeing arrest at this point. Uh, the translation of the final act of Lupikov is not clear, but it is clear that the mutiny did fail and uh, Russia reclaimed the submarine on the night of March 13th, 1992. Oh, and it gets better. So this submarine's been in service, quote, you know, for two years now. It's still 1992, but turns out she doesn't have all of her batteries installed. <laughs> so, yeah, there's uh, no way she can go to sea and submerge for any length of time because she has to run her diesel most of the time. Uh, the batteries that she does have installed, uh, one, it's not complete and doesn't have enough to, uh, to maintain an at sea deployment. So for three years, she just sits by, by the pier waiting for the rest of her battery to, to come in. In 1996, she does go to sea in the Black Sea and is part of the film uh, First Strike, Jackie Chan's film from 1996. From that, she goes back into a port from 1998 to 1999 for repairs. Those repairs are not public, probably more batteries. Yeah. And then she comes back out again. But notice how it, in none of these times, in, in the entire 1990s, does she ever go to sea for a patrol? She'll go to sea to make a movie, yeah, uh, but she'll sit in pier pretty much the entire decade. In 2003, she's in another film, 72 Meters. You can check these films out, by the way. Okay, in 2006, three years later, instead of going to sea and, I don't know, doing a patrol like a normal Navy submarine, she does another movie, yeah. This, uh, this submarine wants to be a superstar. She wants to be famous. So in 2006, um, pre presumably after she's done with filming the movie in Atomica, um, she does provide search assistance for an emergency in the Black Sea. And I could not find out what this event was. So if anyone knows, put in the comments what happened in the year 2006 in the Black Sea that required a search for assistance. Was there a ship sunk or was a plane crashed in the Black Sea? Uh, those are the two most common reasons you'll need a submarine to uh, you know help in a search. But I couldn't find that myself. And in 19, in 2009, three years later, she's in another film, film number four, At All Latitudes. Yeah, I couldn't find a cover for All Latitudes, but it's out there somewhere. So at this point, she's done more movies than combat patrols. You know, she's uh, she's more of a movie star than anyone else. So in 2011, 11 rather, she goes all the way around to Krasnodar for repairs. And so uh, she, she heads all the way up there towards... Uh, north of Europe all the way around. This is probably the longest she's been at sea the entire time. Um, in 2014, she comes back to Sevastopol for repairs. She's always getting repairs, it seems. Sitting by piers, being in dry dock, uh, getting ready to go to the dry dock like she does from 2014 to 2019. When she gets back to Sevastopol, she sits pier side waiting for a dry dock repair facility to become available. And when one does, they don't even have the money to begin the repairs. But 
eventually, at some point between 2020 and 2022, they do get her dry docked. They do get her repaired, fresh coat of paint, brand new uh, missile control system, combat control system, communication system. Uh, they probably worked on the sonar, but they didn't talk about that uh, publicly. So, but my guess is they probably did something there. And here you can see in the photo, they have uh, those, those bow planes extended there. Right now, she will remain in the Black Sea Fleet. We thought she'd go back to the Baltic Fleet, uh, but probably due to all the uh, uh, problems in Ukraine right now with Russia and Ukraine uh, being at war, she's going to remain in the Black Sea Fleet for the time being, probably providing, you know, cruise missile support for uh, attacks ashore because she now has that capability with the new combat control system installed. She can fire the caliber cruise missile. And that's really uh, her. Um, what she brings to the fleet now is, is more of, I, would, I don't want to say VLS because they're not vertical launch tubes, but she can launch the caliber cruise missile out of her torpedo tubes. All right. And there we are. That is the story of B-871, the pump jet Kilo, the one of a kind that has been in more movies than has been on deployments, uh, spends more time pier side waiting for repairs than she does anything else. And when she does get the repair, it takes five years. And uh, she finally gets out of dry dock and she's getting ready to go to sea now. So we will see her deployed to the Black Sea for however long, launch some cruise missiles probably into Ukraine and then go back for repairs again. So this is just another asset they have to the Black Sea fleet. It's the oldest of all the kilos. It is by far the least capable in terms of speed and performance. Um, and she's always broken waiting for repair. Uh, but this is what they're uh, adding to the fleet. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time.